understood his method and, and he was prepared to come out to the theatre to see my, my children, which was nice. <laughs> um, so he was over for a barbecue one night and I said, so George, are you turning out any good actors at Guelph? He said, I don't produce actors, I produce citizens. <laughs> <laughs> Right, George. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask any of these people? Or a comment that you'd like to make? Or, <laughs> or do you want to go have lunch? Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, could, you mentioned uh, a European tour. Could you speak about the, ex the experience? Yes, yeah. Oh God, the experience was incredible. <laughs> um, first of all, you, it's freezing cold, you're leaving Canada and you end up in, in England. And there we are, what stage was it? It was the, the Youth, Young Vic Theatre. The Young Vic Theatre. And you're in awe because you're in the birthplace of theatre where Shakespeare and all the lovely English authors come from. But you're Canadian. <laughs> And it's an incredible experience to see that you're bringing something that is very different to their, sh their theatre. They had never seen anything quite like this production. <coughs> they were quite in awe of it and very controversial in some respects as well, if I recall. Um, we travelled from there over to uh, Holland. Um, and it again was part of the festival, wasn't it? The, part of the um, Holland Festival. Yeah. That's right. So in that time, it was an amazing experience to uh, be traveling as an actor. You know, you always think, oh yeah, I'll go down to the States and become famous, but here you were over in Europe. It, it was just part of the icing on the cake. But most of all, I think you were picking up the energy of the country and learning more about who they were and what they, their theater was like. And you were so damn proud of what you had to do. So damn proud, you know? It was great. Proud to be a Canadian. <laughs> we, uh, we actually, we took, uh, we took two shows. Um, it was in 1976. Oh, that's a long the time Olympics. ago, isn't it? <laughs> Can't get different. Um, we took a show about the Olympics that we had put together, sort of a, mm, a, a retrospective of, of the Olympics from 1898 yeah. uh, or 92, whatever the, the first of the modern Olympics was, up to 76. And our, our take on that was that it was the most commercial Olympics ever uh, in, in the history of them. And we took 10 lost years. So in at the Young Vic, just down the street from the Old Vic <laughs> in London, uh, we, played, we played 10 lost years and the Olympic show uh, alternate evenings, I think. Yes. And uh, yes, the, the Holland Festival, that was lovely because we were on the, uh, on the shores of the North Sea. And we went to Wales too. Uh, indeed, indeed. Yeah. But, but we went to, went to Holland first. Uh, we were there for two weeks. We had five performances in this. It, well, it was great. It was terrific. We had uh, to travel that particular country by, by, by train. Um, we played in, uh, in Amsterdam, the Stadhausberg, uh, to I think probably uh, sort of something the size of the Royal Alex, uh, yeah. if not a little bit larger. And huge. I'm not sure how many of those people actually, how, how many of them spoke English, probably a, a lot, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But um, then back to uh, Sheffield, where we played the two shows over a one week period, I think, and then to a place in North Wales called Mould. <laughs> and just that's for the National Theatre yeah. of Wales. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. In fact, it's become the National Theatre uh, uh, Theatre Cluid is is the name of the theatre. And the theatre had been there for I think maybe three years at that time, or two years. The actual physical building. And when Wales was found, and it was it was way over on a hill from from the hill that Mould was sitting on. And if you asked anybody about that place or if you told them that you were working there, they got very, very grumpy because their tax dollars had risen in order to build that modern building over there, but there was no transportation system in place for them to actually get, get there. to the theater. <laughs> It was very, very strange. Um, and the play was called You Can't Get There From Here. <laughs> <laughs> there was, a, there was a, t a Toronto Workshop Productions play called You Can't Get There From Here. But anyway, um, yeah, yes. Please. Uh, summer of 76. 
I, I think I think it was you who said uh, one night you ended the show with your monologue or the, or that that story, and then you discovered that it was too sad, so you had to end it with a march. Did that mean that the way you produced the show every night changed, or was no. it like a set thing? No, you had it set all the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. The, the play was the same thing thereafter, but that was just playing with them. You have to understand that when you go into a company setting. You work different pieces. You work your heart out on your piece. And you pray to God that it doesn't get cut. Because every day, you would get new lines written in. You would get a rearrangement of how the production was going to be. Even before you went on at night sometimes, George would come backstage and say, oh, we're going to cut that piece over there, so you two tighten up. Um, we'll, you know, we'll rearrange this piece. You were always on your toes, always alive, always new energy, new expectations. You can imagine how on the toes I had to be because it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was sometimes yeah. never informed yeah. that that yeah. piece was gone. He never told me. <laughs> I think that our first, our first, uh, our first preview, or, or sorry, our opening was February the 7th, I believe, of, uh, of 74. And we had two previews uh, on the fifth. The first preview, the show ran three hours long. The second preview, the show ran two hours and 40 minutes long. And the opening night, it ran two hours and 20 minutes long. So snip, snip, So snip, we cut snip. 20 minutes each, each, each of, those, uh, of those previews. Uh, Urjo Carreda, <laughs> who uh, subsequently became the artistic director of the Tarragon Theatre, was at that time the theatre critic for the Toronto Star. And he, much to our outrage and chagrin, came to uh, review the second preview of the show. We were crazy with anger, uh, frustration, until we read his review after our opening, which was a rave of the show. So, um, yeah, we were very... Uh, it, it turned out all right, but... Uh, so, did you comment on the process of choosing and, and uh, how, you, how stuff got put together and where songs come from and how they fit in and any of that kind of stuff in terms of the structure of the piece? Well, in terms of... It, it came from all sorts of things. I mean, the very first day, uh, you know, right from day one, it was to kind of... Movement was needed. And obviously, if you've got a bunch of stories, the problem is that they're static, and what you're looking for is momentum. And so, right the, from the very first hour we were in the theater, the, the first, I mean, the, the, the image that was on the cover of the book was the men on the boxcar. So it was like very clear that we were going to be doing something about men on top of a train. And so the very first thing was searching around for some kind of piece of music that could be adapted, that could kind of have that rhythm of the train. And once you've got that train, you can keep coming back to it. You've got something that's going across. Canada going, guys looking for work, going from one end of the country to the other, guys getting pissed off at the end, going over to Spain. Uh, so that, all that momentum came from within. Now, within this experience too, I can remember uh, uh, in working with pieces and finding pieces, uh, uh, I remember when, the th when, when Jackie Burroughs came into it, that immediately that you could see, I, and I'd worked with her before, I knew her, I kind of pleaded to, to, to uh, with June to get uh, uh, Jackie in on it. And as soon as she was, it was like you could run to the book and know that there were a whole bunch of things that she would just nail like that, that, and the other. So there was a way of personalizing the things to who you had uh, with the material. And as it is, I mean, with that book, I would say that we, we didn't even go further Scratch than scratching a quarter of the stories that were in that book. Yeah. I gave the book recently to a uh, a woman, an actress, director here in Toronto, and, and said, you know, through the pick out, she'd never seen it or anything, you know, and I said, pick out the, your favorite five stories to dramatize, and four of the five she chose weren't even in the show uh, we, we did at all. So there's a lot of material uh, there, wow, because the difference with, was when Paul Thompson and what the Farm Show did, they would have to go up, they collected all that material, edited and all that, lived with those people to do that, when I saw this book, I went, holy mackerel, talk about a shortcut, because all of that <laughs> material and all of that work, Barry Broadfoot had done it kind of thing, and done all the work, and there it was to uh, uh, wield on. And so that there's a lot of times uh, where there was so much that could be done with the text that there was no requirement for it to be any one thing, and that, of course, that you can have 
static moments. If you're going to have it all night, it's going to be uh, dreadful. But the idea is that you, you know, have things move and have things stop, and that's uh, pretty basic stuff, really. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> spins me down in my chair. <laughs> Just curious, you all speak very, very passionately about the show. It's very, very inspiring to listen to. I'm curious about uh, the moment at which you knew that you were, that this was a gem, that this was indeed uh, something to be remembered. Yeah, well, I, I came into it, as I say, after it was in rehearsal, and so we, we all kind of worked at the same time. Everybody was there all the time. So while the rehearsal, there was only one room. I mean, it was a big room like this. So I was, um, I was there all, all the time that rehearsals were going on. So that was going on in my other ear, you know, and I would be doing something. In fact, I always hear it. The booth that was up in the corner over here didn't have glass in it. So you, you couldn't get away. Right, and you could always hear George yelling at somebody. <laughs> but, but you know, you would you would wander out into the house. Obviously, you had to light it. So, you, like like where we work now, we fight like crazy to actually see the damn play before we have to light it, right? Because you know, it's a it's a big thing to work through you know, a huge play like Romeo and Juliet and get a, a run through so we can light it, you know, and see all that's going on. But there, you lived in the middle of it. It was like going to rehearsal every day, which of course you can't do at a place like Stratford. So you know, you, you would just be picking up little bits. Well, you'd be working along, and all of a sudden you'd hear like Diane or Jackie or Cedric saying something and you just kind of you know stop and listen and then that would be over and you'd wander off well there it was just kind of an additive thing and probably I would say maybe two weeks or something like that before it happened you just started saying Jesus Christ like where are they going with this thing right and and it was wonderful and you find yourself not doing anything because you just kept going into rehearsal again right and you watch it and, and it just started to build and build and build and build and build and as I say, it was so simple. It, it, where they were talking about momentum, the, the piece, wa watching George and the actors put the piece together, like what speech comes after what, because you would, you know, I didn't know what order they were going in. But watching this come together, the momentum was phenomenal, because it was all, it was all like verbal momentum. You would, what you, it would come down to some very quiet, you know, <clears throat> you know, very, very plaintive speech, and then it would gradually start building up, and you would have a really funny moment and all that. But the play never stopped moving. I mean, just verbally moving. And as I say, there were only the two production numbers, but otherwise it was just your focus going from here to there, right? And, it, and to me, part of the brilliance of it was it was the, the order in which the pieces you know, were, were placed, that you just, it, it just flowed. You just never lost interest, you, you couldn't, right? As I say, you would come down to maybe like one that, that, <coughs> that Peter just did that was very short, you know, and you would go there and then there'd be an, a longer one, but it was just, it was just moving all the time. And, uh, but there was a point at which you just, it just grabbed you and you figured, you know, I can't wait for this to happen, right? And, uh, well, we ran it how long for the first time? A long time. 23, was it 23 weeks? Yeah. Which was, was like first. astounding. Yeah. yeah. 17 weeks, <coughs> I think, was the first run. Yeah, the first one, yeah. To, then you had to close for some other show that had rented the space and then came yeah. back almost immediately in the fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it was amazing just that's going in. Neil Carson. <laughs> so, yeah, Neil Carson had it wrong, but that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great loss. You know, it's interesting you bring up that point, when do you know? I think when uh, uh, I first started to realize that the show was good is really in hindsight because you're living the life, you're, you're inside it, you really are busy uh, experiencing it. But when we were in Newfoundland, do you remember we had the groupies? That came, <laughs> honest to God, they came to every show. Oh, they yeah, traveled yeah. From, from city to city when we were touring in Newfoundland, and they go out and have a beer with us after the show. I mean, that's when you really are big, you know, is when you got those groupies. That, that leads to uh, 10 lost beers. Yeah. <laughs> Just following that, I went into the world's biggest bookstore the other day on Saturday, last Sunday, to get this because I couldn't find my original copy. And the man downstairs said they had it, and he would show me where it was in the, in the Canadian history section. So on the way upstairs, he said, you know, in 1975, somebody did an amazing theater production. And he said, I saw it. He was 17 in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And he saw it, and he could quote it. Right, and he, he still had the visual thing. He talked about the boxcars and all this kind of stuff. And I hadn't said a word to him that I had anything to do with it. But. So I, you know, there was that kind of impact it, it had. Yeah. And another one was that 